Um, <clears throat> the title of my talk is Listening to Photographs, Inaudible Temporalities in the Work of Daisuke Yokota. Um, I want to explore a transmodal discourse this afternoon, moving from the oral to the visual and back to the oral hoping thereby to make photography resonate with the sounding arts. As much as possible, I hope to steer clear of any transcendental mood that might situate this resonance between seeing and hearing in unifying subjectivity, somehow separate from its perceptual modalities. By listening to and speculatively tuning a couple of photographs, I want to suggest that certain inaudible possibilities can emerge in the temporalities latent in the photographs themselves. My interest in this project was triggered by the recent photo books of Daisuke Yokota, a young Japanese photographer born in 1983, whose work has taken the international photography and photo book world by storm over the last two years. Here are three representative examples of Yokota's photographs from two different books, both of which were published in 2014. The books are called Vertigo, and Toran Superiento, which I take it is Japanese for transparent. So there's an image. We'll come back to these. Even this quick sampling, I hope, of Yokota's work reveals some of its characteristic mysteries. The indexical or referential dimension of the photographs is often obscured, both by a generally dark palette and by a variety of techniques that introduce into the photographic image distortions, distractions, and other visual equivalents of noise. In Vertigo, pages 8-9, for example, is this an aerial shot of a mountainous massif, or a study of clouds seen from below, or equipment on a floor covered with a tarp, or rumpled bed sheets. Each of these referential possibilities would resonate with other images in vertigo. I didn't make those things up. They're all actually resonate elsewhere. But the image here is insufficient, I think, to make its referent unambiguous. This indexical indeterminacy, particularly in its mixing of macro and micro scale possibilities, is surely part of what lends the book its vertiginous title. Even when the photographic subject is tolerably clear, as in his nude studies, like Vertigo, page 29, Yokota's work relentlessly insists on being received as an object in its own right. Moreover, this object generally unfolds itself in a series of layers. The longer you examine the image uh, or the page, the more you make out layers in the image, as though the three-dimensionality of that which is photographed were replaced by a multidimensionality of background pools of light, foreground scratches and pockmarks, and often uncanny scenes that can scan as simultaneously two and three-dimensional. In Toran Superianto 48-49, for example, the image seems to be built around the geometry of a claustrophobic concrete room. Although the page is flooded with what could be a superimposed image of clouds. At yet another level of the image, there are various pockmarks, he loves pockmarks, and even a pair of flowing horizontal forms that might be the paths of liquids poured across the scene. What's notable is that this multidimensionality remains strictly in the photographic image, since Yakota does not typically tamper with or distress the photograph itself on the book's pages. Toran Superiento, I can't say this word, but there it is, is a book in which all the photographic images are themselves printed on transparency film. Hence, its title, which simply means transparent in Japanese. So that the layering of each individual photograph is intensified by distortions introduced by the possibility of looking through multiple transparencies at the same time. So this is pages 48, 49. But there's page 49. The subject of many interviews, Daisuke Yokoda regularly invokes the influence of the musician Aphex Twin on his work. 
And this is the next step for me in attempting to listen to and to tune his photographs. In an interview from 2012 with Dan Abbey, Yakota says of Aphex Twins' music, quote, there's a lot of experimentation with delay, reverb, and echo, which is playing with the way that you perceive time. Of course, there's no time in a photograph, but I thought about how to apply this kind of effect or filter to photography. I was definitely influenced by the idea of ambience. Unquote. In Selected Ambient Works, Volume 2 from 1994, for example, Aphex Twin creates a series of temporal frames filled with largely banal and repetitive, apparently artificially synthesized musical phrases, no two of which are quite the same. In place of the kind of melodic and harmonic development associated with traditional song structures, these time frames differentiate themselves by means of degrees of reverberation added to the musical phrases effectively suggesting varying spaces of performance and listening. Within each time frame, melodic motifs repeat, but irregularly, with unpredictable delays and occasional echoes articulating their variable structures. In short, Aphex Twin creates a kind of sounding art that depends on the sonic effects of delay, reverb, and echo for its very structure and substance, while its musical materials remain utterly secondary to this evocation of ambience. As a next step, <clears throat> then, in speculatively tuning Yakoda's photographs, I'd like us to listen for ways in which these photographs might play with the perception of time, along lines similar to what Yakoda hears in the work of Aphex Twin. I've already called attention to the multidimensional layering so characteristic of these photographs, layering that distresses, distorts, and otherwise overrides the indexical or documentary character of the photographic images. It will not come as a surprise that this layering is a manifestation of a complex photographic process, but what I find intriguing is the way Yakota himself describes this process in terms of temporality, as though the photographs themselves are essentially traces of invisible and inaudible processes. In a 2014 article in the British Journal of Photography, Gemma Padley gives a quick overview of Yakoda's process. She writes, Yakoda takes his images with a compact digital camera and then re-photographs the printed images using medium format film, usually four by six. He then prints them again, making use of leaked light, overheated developers, sometimes the developing solution is boiling, and singeing the negatives the prints are sometimes re-photographed up to 10 times, adding more distortion each time." Unquote. The reason for this process, Yakoda indicates, is, quote, to portray memory, what we remember as well as what we don't. I can visualize invisibleness, he says, or things I don't remember through those changes. And to visualize them, I've removed any details on a picture. In an earlier interview with his colleague, Olivier Pinfat, Yakoda links the temporality of memory to repeatability. Quote, we recollect a single experience from the past again and again. But I don't think these recollected memories are always the same. Memories are always brought out in relation to a present condition. And through this repeatable recollection of memories, I believe a memory becomes influenced by, and therefore a product of, what is happening to us now. Although the physical experience of time is singular, I believe time at a conscious level can multiply every time one recollects a memory, and the different experiences of times generated by these actions pass in parallel to a physical time." Unquote. In a public interview from just this past June, Yakoda elaborates his photographic process a little bit more. Quote, to submerge a print out of the copy machine in water for a long time until it's dripping and soft, then crumbling it up, stretching it straight again, then drying it, I'm manipulating time. As its final form, I take a copy of it again, but the past record has been messed up. To copy a damaged thing proves that there, a time period is past, a time period of it being damaged before it was copied. Later on in the same interview, he says, it's more exciting to be betrayed by the result. Shooting or making work with the desire of wanting to see a result that betrays my expectations, 
that's more attractive to me. Unquote. What we see in Yakota's photographs is then a profoundly multi layered trace of a rather non traditional series of digital, analog, and chemical photographic processes that inaudibly evoke the delay, reverb, and echo of Aphex Twins' work. The pages of Yakota's books offer inaudible, and nearly invisible, vibratory witness to the ceaseless repetition and difference that is temporal consciousness. The photographs do not represent the inmixing of memory and repetition. They are the almost invisible evidence of inaudible temporalities. Crucially, however, these temporalities are not essentially tied to Yokota as a kind of transcendental subject shaping his works of art. In his interview with Pin Fat, Yokota insists on the kinds of dislocation that photography makes possible. Quote, Realistically, the relation between humans and their surrounding environments is not a separable entity. Once things are photographed, they can become dislocated and isolated from this mutual relationship. In the creative process of my works, what's most important is that the photographed object is not only completely dislocated from the surrounding environment, but importantly, from myself as well, at the exact moment I took the photograph, so it once again becomes an object of my interest. This attempt to dislocate an object from me, or to include elements of uncontrollable errors in a process of my creation, usually brings out clues for the next idea or project." Unquote. In a 2013 interview with Kohei Oyama, who's actually one of his publishers, Yokota stresses the importance of materiality in effecting these kinds of dislocations and relates this directly to the concept of noise. Quote, I guess it's common to think that the documented image is what is real in photography. But by accentuating the materiality of the film, which by nature is more real than the documented image, the image actually becomes more abstract. And I'm interested in this reverse perspective. Emphasis on the physicality of the recording medium is considered a noise, an element disturbing the recorded image of the photo shoot. I feel like I exist more like a selecting person. I decide what to use and how to combine them rather than I make the image. Also, I think it's important to intentionally bring out the imbalance and noise of each tool." Unquote. The resulting imbalanced and noisy photographs are then not so much the products of the photographer's eye as they are traces of a series of processes selected by him. Speculatively tuning Yakota's work just a little more, I suggest that his rather abstract and distressed photographs might be exemplary manifestations of what the American photographer Jeff Wall has described as the liquid intelligence in film, in photography, something akin to the hallucinatory unconscious of the more familiar optical intelligence. Wall turns to the work of Andrei Tarkovsky to find a metaphor for the way that, quote, in photography, the liquids study us even from a great distance. In, Tar in Tarkovsky's film Solaris, Wall writes, quote, some scientists are studying an oceanic planet. Their techniques are typically scientific, but the ocean is itself an intelligence which is studying them in turn. It experiments on the experimenters by returning <coughs> their own memories to them in the form of hallucination perfect in every detail, in which people from their pasts appear in the present and must be related to once again, maybe, in a new way." This strikes me as a remarkably accurate description, written when Yakoda was only six years old, of the way in which Daisuke Yakoda's photographs actually work. Their inaudible evocations of delay, reverb, and echo open up an hallucinatory world, a world where the repetition and difference of past and present both finds its bearings and vertiginously loses them again. A world where transparency reveals itself to be a vertigo of ambiguity. All these effects present in each individual photograph are ramified when they're perused in the context of Yakoda's photo books, where the sequencing of photographs inevitably induces even more delay, reverb, and echo, since as Yakoda remarks to Pinfat, photograph does not exist on its own. 
but can connect with other photographs recalled by the photograph you're looking at now. Having tried to bring Yakoda's work into attunement with Wall's notion of liquid intelligence, it's surely a small step to find these photographs resonating as well with Jane Bennett's account of the vibrant materialism of things. Once we successfully reduce the volume of these photographs' referential or indexical qualities, what comes into tune is how the photographs' traces of digital, analog, and chemical processes themselves invoke the repetition and difference of temporality. The hard focus of optical intelligence gives way to the uncontrollable errors of liquid intelligence. Representation gives way to hallucination. And the photographic image fixed on the page, apparently abiotic and dead, thereby finds a life in its imbalance and noise. Bennett writes that the aim in her work, quote, is to articulate the elusive idea of a materiality that is itself heterogeneous itself a differential of intensities, itself a life. In this strange, vital materialism, there's no point of pure stillness, no indivisible atom that is not itself a quiver with virtual force. It is, I suggest, precisely this quivering of a strange, vital materialism that characterizes Yakoda's strangely vital photographs. And this vital materialism, in turn, provides the most profound analog to the difference in repetition characteristic of the inmixing of memory and consciousness in temporality. In this way, the vertigo introduced by Yakoda's photo book Vertigo might best be grasped as the erasure of all easy distinctions between the abiotic and the biotic, between the perceived and the remembered, between consciousness and materiality, between intention and chance, and of course, between the invisible and the inaudible. I'd like to bring to a close my attempt to listen to and to tune speculatively Daisuke Yakoda's photographs by returning to the domain of the sounding arts. It should be clear that my descriptions of his work and his distinctive approach to photographic process, that Yakoda's photographs can also be regarded as visual traces of invisible performances. To the extent that process is launched by the photographer's hand, and continued by the vibrant materiality of analog repetition and chemical imbalances are made visible in his works, these works are fundamentally performative in their very nature. It should come as no surprise then that Yakoda has begun to do live performances in which photographs and photo books are quite literally produced in the tight time frame of a performative event with an audience. In a performance held at the Tate Modern Museum in London this past May, for example, Yakoda and his friend and fellow photographer, Hiroshi Takazawa, working under the joint alias of Effect Twin, produced 50 photo books in the space of an hour, each experimenting with highly unusual printing materials, iron powder, and cement. And there's a sample double page. Yakoda's on the left, Takazawa's on the right. The YouTube video documenting this performance <laughs> suggests that the event constituted a kind of sound art itself with the two photographers' voices and somewhat frantic activities all available to the audience. In this sense, then, the photographs that constitute Effect Twins resulting photo book untitled 215, 2015 provide visible traces of both now invisible and now inaudible <coughs> activities and processes. My conclusion is all too obvious then. Listening to Daisuke Yakoda's photographs and tuning them speculatively in resonance with the sounding arts, I hope to have shown, or at least suggested, that the distinction between the visual and the oral, between photography and sound art, is profoundly unstable, indeterminate, and, yes, vertiginous. Mm -hmm. Thanks.